Appreciate everybody being here. You may wonder why we're talking about insects in a, in a pasture meeting or coming out of a drought. There's two primary reasons. The first thing we'll talk about is external parasites. And a lot of the animals, in some cases, may be under a lot of stress. And these external parasites put a lot of stress on these animals in any year, and especially coming out of a drought when they're maybe more stressed than normal. The other thing is once you get your grass growing, we got some things that may harvest it before you want it harvested, and it would be the wrong animal. I'll mention first, we're going to just look at two or three the things that feed on, on, on blood, and one is horn fly. Of course, they breed out here in these pastures and these paths that are not disturbed. If these things are broken up, then they cannot breed. This particular fly has to have this intact. If they're broken up a little bit, even fire ants will take a lot of a lot of these horn flies that are breeding in a situation like this. I, I show here 20 times feeding per day. That's really on the low side. It's probably feed 30, 40 times a day. They generally stay on the animal during the daytime as opposed to another fly we'll talk about here in a minute. We're talking about uh, having weight losses at 200, 250 flies per animal. This is especially true of English breed cattle. Uh, now, control, and, and I used to do some tests years ago on, on controlling horn flies, and, and actually I found out some of these self-treatment devices were a heck of a lot better than spray. And a heck of a lot, you know, you could spray them. You could put spray on it and we'll kill flies. But on, on long term, if you keep these things in good shape, these uh, ear tags hanging on a chain, or dust bags, uh, back rubs, tube treaters, or liquid wicks, and that kind of thing, and you maintain those things, they'll do a good job. Of course, a lot of people do use uh, ear tags. We recommend alternating from one year to the next from uh, organophosphate type tag to pyrethroid type tag. To give you some idea of what 250 flies looks like, this is what it looks like on the animal right here in this section. But if you look here, this is way more than 250 flies. So uh, that kind of situation, that's way above the what we would consider a treatment level. Uh, as far as the resistance management is concerned, I mentioned this already about uh, switching from organophosphate to pyrethroid so that you hold that down over time. If you use straight pyrethroids all the time, you'll develop resistance fairly fast. Uh, another thing is to, up here on, on this particular one right here, treat only when 200 and 250 flies per head. And then uh, you wait to that point, then you, then you apply the treatment at that time instead of uh, all year long, maybe. Right down here on, on this one, apply spray at tag removal time. The reason for that is you may have some resistance building up, and uh, as far as uh, uh, if, you'll, if you'll spray at that, you'll take with a different type of material, you'll take uh, those, maybe those resistant flies out and cut down on the build up the resistance. A stable fly, they breed in a totally different kind of situation, unlike the, the horn flies. This is a lot larger fly. In fact, it's bigger than a house fly. But uh, and it doesn't take as many of them to harm the animal. Look at that, 20 flies per head. But these flies don't rest on the animal very long. They rest their feet. They feed on the animal. Then they rest on the walls of barns and things of that nature. So most of the time, this fly is a problem around a barn, especially where you've got water leaks, uh, such as uh, I've got listed here. And you've got combination of feed and manure, and all three of these combined, this is the kind of situation they, they breed in. So one way to help this situation is to spray the resting areas, the walls of barns and the things of this nature. Uh, I'll mention a little bit about ticks. I'm not sure which way the tick population is going to go uh, this particular year. These, uh, like for example, Gulf Coast ticks and others, they have some uh, birds they live on, small animals, and if those are reduced to number, maybe we won't see so many ticks this year. Uh, one thing I want to mention right down here uh, is about control considerations. I was told here not too long ago that this is not legal, and I've, I've been wondering about that. I left it in here because I still think it's a good practice. If you're feeding deer and, and have uh, self-treatment devices for those deer, 
then you can cut down pigs on the deer herd as, as well as on uh, cattle. Here are some of the materials that could be used for this. Now I want to mention uh, the, the impact of fire ants. Fire ants actually take the tick numbers down. Where I'm from in East Texas, we used to have a lot more Lone Star ticks over there than we do now, and mainly because of fire ants that come in and take them. So a benefit, believe it or not, of fire ants. Here the, I'm just going to show one example of the tick, the male Gulf Coast tick, the female, the female Gulf Coast tick. And uh, kind of a summary of these external parasites, uh, that's all I'm going to cover as far as external parasites are concerned. Uh, we're looking at, uh, mention again, when to start the uh, horn fly control program. It, it may be before late May. It really may be early May or even earlier than that as, as uh, we have warm conditions, warmer conditions maybe in any particular year. And then set up those treatment devices I've mentioned. Uh, and maintain, now this is critical, maintaining those devices. I've seen cases where we weren't getting benefit out of horn fly control because let's say the dust bags were, were hard and you know they, the stuff had hardened up and, and nothing was coming out of the dust bags. I've seen cases also where there's too much dust coming out of the dust bags and they were overusing the dust. So when you purchase a dust bag, you kind of get a feel for that after you purchase a few of them, but which ones are giving off about the right amount. It doesn't take a whole heck of a lot, as long as the animals will use those things every day or so. Then uh, I'll mention, I hadn't mentioned lice before at all, this last comment down here. Uh, if you have a lice problem, the, the best time to treat for those right before Thanksgiving and by two weeks later those two applications should take care of, of any problems you might have with the lice on cattle for the winter time. Now then, one of my favorite areas to talk about, some of you have seen these slides many times I would imagine, talk about army worms and look what's favorable for their development. Number one, a long drought period. After a long drought period, we get rainfall, we get rapid growth of grasses, and we have a highly fertilized, you know, especially they favor all. You'll find them in any kind of, whether it's fertilized or not, but the moths that lay the eggs from fall army worm, they know how to find these places where this grass is growing rapidly. And they lay eggs in these masses of 50 to 100 eggs or more, uh, they hatch in three to five days. Their larval stage varies depending on how cool it is, but let's just say in general it's a 16-day time period when they're in the larval stage. That's a little over, you know, just slightly over two weeks. And the critical thing is the last four days in that larval stage, they'll consume 85% of their total food intake. And you don't really a lot of times see a lot of damage if you're just driving down the road to this insect and all of a sudden you see it and it's almost too late to do anything about it. So my recommendation is as things start to green up and grow is to go out and really examine your pastures at least once a week and that means getting your head down in the grass and your rear end up in the air so you can see it. I had a call a number of years ago from a person in Goliad County and lo and behold, if uh, they, they heard it on, on the radio, on the, remember WOAI, Bill Mike Reynolds? And uh, the person said, well, I went and looked around and I didn't get out. I think everything looked good. The grass looked green. About four or five days later, came back and a lot of it was gone. So you need to be watching for this insect. Incidentally, whoop. This is the pupil stage. They go into the pupil stage in the soil. Now you might wonder what this is. I'll take that off. This is actually a parasitic wasp. It's laying an egg. They, she will lay the egg down on into that pupil case. We see some of those around here. And sometimes we get high parasitism rates, not only of the, of the caterpillar itself, but different types of parasites, but uh, even the pupil stage. I want to concentrate on this rule of thumb for treating pastures right here. 
at uh, three or more caterpillars per square foot, and I'm talking about caterpillars that are about half grown or larger, that would be kind of a general rule of thumb to use in whether or not you need to treat or not. Most times that I've seen it, it's been four or five times greater numbers than this. And to give you some idea of what three fall army worms could consume, if they reach the, all the way to the end of their larval stage, about 30% of the leaf area of a good coastal Bermuda, a, a good uh, heavy coastal Bermuda grass uh, stand. So they can eat quite a bit at that three or more per square foot. Here are some insecticides that uh, we, a lot of them I've looked at in test plots over the years. The old standby seven, we always compare against that one. It's quite costly compared to some of these pyrethroids like Karate, Mustang Max, and Bathroid. And now some of these are being sold uh, gen under generic names and might even be cheaper. These are the three probably are, are their generic forms, the cheapest ones. Now we got one down here, Intrepid, by Dow AgroSciences. And this particular product uh, is an insect growth regulator. It's about at least it has been in the past about double the cost of these other. It does give you a little bit longer residual. Uh, in my book, I go for cheap materials. Some of you folks know why that is. It's pretty tight. Uh, mentioned grasshoppers. I'm going to make a prediction on grasshoppers because we have so far have only had one of the key things that would create high numbers of grasshoppers. Now, don't come back and tell me, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going out on a limb here a little bit. And I'll just say that last fall, we did not have enough uh, uh, food resources for these grasshoppers to lay a lot of eggs. So I don't think we went in with a lot of eggs. We did have a mild winter. But something else I've noticed of late, we get grasshoppers hatching already. And it's a little too early for that. The thing that we get most of our high numbers of grasshoppers if we have a delayed spring, a cool spring, and by the time they do start emerging, and then in that situation, uh, they have resources there, and they can really cause a lot of problems. We'll probably get a lot of death of these grasshoppers that are emerging right now, because they don't have a lot to feed on. Another thing you person might look at this number right here, this eight or more grasshoppers per square yard, that's considered a damaging level. Uh, action tre threshold for treatment. Another thing it might, you might find is these immature grasshoppers don't have a full set of wings yet. And most of the ones that we do deal with, they do end up with a full set of wings. There's a few grasshopper species that never, they can't fly, never have a full set of wings. But anyway, uh, if we have nymphs, they're going to be in the hatching areas. That's an area where the, the grasshopper, the females lay their egg cases, and a lot of times it's in a small confined area. Let's say you've got 200 acres, you might have just two or three spots, it'd be two or three acres each, where these hatching areas might be present. If you find those, it'd be good to go treat those early. It would be a lot less costly treating sometimes uh, these hatching areas. Because you just have a 10 acre place and you've got all kind of others around you that you wouldn't accomplish much. If two or three hundred acres, you might accomplish a lot by treating these hatching areas. The last thing I'll mention are these desert termites. You've already seen they've already caused their damage. And uh, I'll, let me say up front, I do not personally believe that we can do anything economically to cut these, these, uh, these uh, termites down. Uh, what they've done, though, is they have taken most of the, the dead material off the ground. They've opened the ground up to just, there's, there's, no, there's no vegetation there. There's no debris there to hold the rainfall or anything like that. So this, can, this is, when it rains, it packs the soil. So I think they do cause a lot of damage, but I don't think there's anything economic we can do about it. If you want to do anything at all, uh, break up these chimneys. And you could add, add a chemical treatment there, but I just don't think it's economically feasible to do so. But if you decide to at least drag some of these down, and some of you might want to try this on some areas and not on other areas, drag those down about, I don't know what time in the morning, but soon as the dew, it, everything dries, and these things are where they will, will, will uh, shatter real easy, 
But don't wait too late. Because early in the morning, those termites are high up. They're not down in the ground. If it gets hot during the day, most of them are going to be down. So just about the time those tubes dry and they'll shatter, pull drags over them, and you'll break them up. And once again, if you've got those fire ants there, they will go after these termites like you won't believe. In fact, you wonder where they, those, those fire ants even came from. I've knocked these tubes over before. Within just a few seconds, there's fire ants and other types of ants picking them up. Is that the same termite that these bulk and grass are Yes, uh, we have two or three species down here of these desert termites. And of course, they, as you notice, I didn't explain this, but they put these mud tubes. Yeah, they do it on bulk and grass. They'll do it on, absolutely. They'll do it on uh, any kind of cellulose material. They'll even build these things over cow piles. They'll, they'll feed on that, or on a, let's say a cedar fence, they'll, they'll shake, they don't eat the wood inside, but they'll, they eat the surface of it all. So this, this, and one of these termites is very interesting in that its soldier is called a pseudoporum termite, and it's a little, kind of an oil spout looking thing on its head, and it, it will shoot it, it, at its enemies, like ants and maybe other termites, it will shoot this little sticky stuff out, that's the way it tries to protect the workers. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. That, that's one of the desert termites. Others have regular soldier termites for the big, the big mandibles. So that's uh, what I plan to cover today. Of course, I think what we've heard up to now and after my talk, probably a lot more critical than, uh, than mine. But on the other hand, if everything starts to look good and you start getting this grass to grow, be watching for army worms because they'll take it out in a hurry if you're not careful. So be ready. Time for questions.